But um, hey, anyone ever heard of a French author called Guy Maupassant? Anyone ever heard of Guy Maupassant? No, you guys, so you guys don't know anything about French literature, is that true? Yep. Wow, well, not that he lied till I did this. Anyway, uh, Guy, there's a French author called Guy Maupassant. He lived in the 1800s, and he's actually, been, he's actually regarded as the greatest uh, short story writer in the history of France. So uh, anyone like short stories? Well, this, this guy was the best that France has ever produced. And uh, he was very successful. He had everything. He lived affluently, had a yacht in the Mediterranean. He had a home on the coast. He had a luxurious unit in Paris. And it was said of him that his critics praised him, men admired him, and women worshipped him. This guy's got it all. But at the height of his fame, Maupassant went insane. He tried to commit suicide. He spent months apparently in mindless utterances and racked with bodily pain before he died at the age of 42. After he died, some people went through his belongings and his things and they found a diary of his and they opened up his diary and in his diary they found these words. I have coveted everything taken pleasure in nothing. I've coveted everything and taken pleasure in nothing. In other words, I got everything I wanted, but I enjoyed none of it. I got everything I wanted in this life, everything you could possibly have, was mine, at my fingertips on tap. I had it all, but I enjoyed none of it. Hopefully, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the issue of contentment. And, and hopefully, if anything has stood out over the last couple of weeks, it's been this, that A, contentment is possible. It is possible that we can live a contented life. Contentment is different to satisfaction. Satisfaction is temporary. Contentment is a more long-term thing. We can actually live a satisfied life, a contented life, sorry. But contentment for us is not determined by our external circumstances our situations we find ourselves in, and it's not determined by the things that we have or the things that we don't have. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul writing to the Philippians, he says this, and this is in response to a generous offering that they had given to him whilst he was in prison, whilst he was a prisoner, he was not a free man, he was restricted and limited, and, and he said this to the Philippians, he said, I'm not saying this because I am in need, he said, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He says, I've learnt to be content. In other words, contentment is something that we have the opportunity to learn. Anyone like learning things? Who likes learning? I, I just want the end game. Anyone like me? I, I don't want the time it takes to learn a lesson. When I was at school, I, I don't want to have to go to that class and listen to a teacher and look at scribblings on a blackboard, with blackboards back in our day, and, and I don't want to have to go home and pick up a textbook and read and study, but I do want the feeling you get at the end of the test when you got 20 out of 20. But how many of you know you're not going to get that result? There's a process called learning that you've got to go through if you want to get there. And Paul's saying this, he's saying you can have contentment, but it's not going to come just because you click your fingers. Contentment is something that we as human beings need to learn. And more so, especially in Western culture today, where we live in a world that is filling us and feeding into us the mindset that you should actually be completely discontented with the car you've got because we just bought another one out and you need it. You should be discontented with that jumper. That's last year's jumper. Man, this winter we've just got a better jumper that's way better. It'll keep you warmer this winter than that one will. Same material, just but apparently it's better for you this winter. And we live in a culture that's always telling us you need more in order to be happy. In order to be contented, you need more. And so we live on this treadmill of thinking that if we just get that, or if I can just make it to there, that the secret to contentment lies somewhere off in the distance, wrapped up in something that I don't have right now. Paul's saying, no, no, no. Here I am telling you, making it very clear to you, I'm in a prison chained up. And I'm telling you that I've learnt how to be content. I've learnt how to be content with everything. More percent here had everything except for what? Contentment. He said, I had everything, enjoyed nothing. In other words, just because you got everything doesn't make you contented. And Paul says that, he says, I've learned how to be content with much. But he said, I've learned how to be content with little. So just having everything doesn't naturally make you contented. You've got to learn how to be content with everything. In the same way, having nothing doesn't mean you have to be discontented. You can learn to be contented with nothing. And that's the lesson that Paul's trying to lay out here, is that contentment is something that we can all have, but it's something we need to learn how to have. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. 
Because God has said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. It's interesting that he says, keep your lives free from the love of money. He doesn't say, keep your life free from money. That's pretty hard, isn't it? He just says, don't get tangled up in the love of money. So, some, some, in some church circles, we think money is evil. Money's not evil. Nowhere in the Word of God, nowhere in these ancient documents, nowhere will you find anybody that says money is evil, and if you have it, you're sinning. It's not there. Money is necessary, and there's nothing wrong with money. What we're encouraged is don't fall in love with money. Don't think that money is the source of all life and spend your whole life chasing after money, chasing after things, thinking that will give you something that you can't have right here, right now, where you are. It's the love of money that the Bible talks against and these ancient writers said will destroy you and will corrupt you and will take your life down a path that you don't want to go down. It'll take you down a path where you're never contented and never satisfied and always wanting more. And how many marriages have been destroyed because people are chasing after money? We want more money, so we'll work more hours and more jobs and families fall apart and we don't have time for one another. People physically burn out themselves because they're constantly chasing more and more and more and never feel like they have enough and so on. And the damage that's caused is immense. And so what he's saying here is nothing wrong with money, but don't love money. But what's really interesting, he says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Again, we talked last week, contentment is not resignation. He's saying be content with what you have. He's not saying don't dream of something better. You can, you can dream of something better. You can go for something bigger and faster and higher and you can have ambitions and dreams and goals. As a matter of fact, the word of God generally, these guys would encourage that. Go after that. Be better, do more, aim high, all this stuff. But what he's saying is that be content where you are now with what you have. Because if you can't find contentment here, when you get that goal, you'll be the same discontented person just with more things. You're the same discontented person just in a different circumstance or a different place or a different job or with a faster car. But you're going to be the same discontented person. So he says... Be content with what you have. But then what's interesting here is he gives you a reason why that you can be contented with what you have. And it's not, it's not be content with what you have because one day you'll have more. It, it's, these ancient writers had a secret to life that you find in just about every promise, or what Christians would call a promise in these ancient documents. There's this, almost like this condition. You can have this, but there's a condition to it. And he says here, be content with what you have. And here's the reason why you can be content with what you have. It's because of what you have. You can be content with what you have, whether you think it's much or little, because of what you have. He says, don't forget, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. So you can be content with what you have, but you've got to understand what you really have. You really have God. You have God with you. No matter what you have, you have God. No matter what you think of what you have, think about what you actually have. This is what he's saying. Be content with what you have. Why can you be content with it? Because you've got God. And it doesn't matter what you find down here on earth, it's not going to give you what God alone can give you. It's not going to match the contentment and the peace that God himself can give you, the knowledge of knowing that the creator of the universe, through Jesus, you're back in relationship with him, he's got his eyes on you, he won't take them off you, he loves you, he's for you, and he's not against you. He says because of that, you can find contentment in a jail cell when your hands are chained. You can find contentment with rats running around. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can find contentment as you're walking towards a fiery furnace going, my God will deliver me, but even if he doesn't deliver us, he's still God and he's still with us. He'll be in there. It doesn't matter. God is with us. Presence is everything. And just about every time you find this in the Bible, don't you? You find these great promises of God, but there's this kind of condition there. It's like, just remember, it's only possible because I'm with you. Because I'm with you, these things are possible. Because I'm with you, you can... Thrive in any circumstance or any situation if you keep yourself reminded of the fact that it's because I'm there with you. I'm with you. So nobody wants to live a discontented life. It's not a goal we don't want it. But the fact of the matter is this. How often do we actually contribute to our own discontentment? You ever thought about that? You ever, ever find yourself in life and you're discontented and you're not liking and so on? And we're always looking for reasons, aren't we? How often do we stop and look internally and go, well, hang on, let me look in there and see if there's a reason. 
Let's see if I'm contributing anything to the discontentment factor in my life at the moment. Am I playing a role in this? And I think if we did, we'd probably find that we generally play a fairly big role in it. We generally play a fairly big role in our own sense of discontentment. So what I want to do this week is just very quickly five very practical, simple things that I think each of us, I want you to think about it, ask yourself the question, five simple things that I think if we get these things right, we can go a long way to discovering the contentment that Paul says, I learnt how to be content in any situation and in every circumstance. Five simple, very practical things, and we'll run through them. Number one, know the difference between a need and a want. Have you ever sat back and thought about the difference between a need and a want? Most of us, it's just, we want, we want, we want, we want, we want. But there's a difference in life between what an actual need is and what's simply a want. Now, there's nothing wrong with having wants. But it's amazing how much discontent breeds in our hearts because we're looking at a want, we haven't got the want, and so we get all discontented and internally discombobulated because what we want hasn't happened. But if we would just have a look and, and look at what we need, we'd probably find some sense of peace in our world, that, okay, our needs are met. Yeah, everything I want isn't always met, but everything I need is met. The things I actually need. Here's the definition of a need. It's something that is necessary for healthy life to function. That's a need. Is a, is a brand new BMW a need to get you to work? No, you don't need a brand new BMW, but you do need to get to work, right? But do you need it? No, don't necessarily need that, but I'm all up in arms because I don't have the latest car and, the, and, and, and when I park my car in the driveway when it's got Beamers and I've got my old Toyota and, uh, hey, but, but what's the need? The need is to get to work I mean, well how come I don't have steak every night? Well, well hang on I've got, I've got food on the table, I might not like it might not be the tastiest, might not be the best but if I can get in my mind the fact that you know what, it's about needs versus wants and the truth of the matter is I dare say looking around this room the fact that you all got here the fact that you're all looking like you've had a couple of meals you, that you're not ribs popping out the fact that there's a roof over your head the fact that you're wearing clothing I'm going to make a bold declaration and say you're in a pretty good place Amen. I would say your needs have been pretty well met I'm not saying all your wants are, but I'm saying the basic needs, that which is necessary for a healthy life, hands up if you think it's being met in your world right now. It's an amazing thing. Start to focus a little bit on the needs and get excited about the fact that, you know what, yeah, I don't have everything I want, but everything I need is there. A want can be defined as this, something that we feel improves the quality of life. Now, there's nothing wrong with improving the quality of your life. It's a good thing. Go for it. But don't allow yourself to have discontentment bred in you and lose your soul rest because of what you don't have that you don't actually need. You don't actually need. If we can learn to define and know the difference between a need and a want, that will help us to find ourselves and remain in a place of contentment in this life. In Philippians 4.19... Paul says to the Philippian churches, he says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God will meet all your needs. God, if you're a believer in this room, God's made a promise to you. He says, I'll, I'll meet your needs. Follow me, stick with me, I'll, I'll meet your needs. He didn't make a promise about your wants. And before somebody says, well, hang on, what about Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the Hebrew, that word actually means have needs. They just translate the word want. But if you go back and you have a look at it, it's really speaking about you lacking your needs. Okay? God meets our needs. And you know what? I believe God goes above and beyond that. And I believe in a God that gives us our wants. This is by no means saying God won't give you some of the things you want. I believe God can. I believe God gave you the wisdom to get some of those things you want too, by the way. Exercise financial wisdom. Be smart. Save. Have a budget. All these basic things. Eat right. Ex all these basic things. And you know what's amazing? How life can go forward and you can reach for the stars and get better and go further and become and all this sort of... Nothing wrong with that. But learn to differentiate the difference between what a need is and what a want is. Matter of fact, if you're a believer in Jesus here, I would expand the word needs to include this. I'd say anything that is required for you to be the person God wants you to be and fulfill the purpose that God has you here for then that's a need for you. To fulfill the purpose that God has for you in this life, then I'll put that in the category of, of needs. And the promise of God is, stay focused on me, I'll meet your needs. I'll meet your needs. I'll make sure that you have what you need to be who you are and to do what I've called you to do. 
It's amazing how much discontent comes from simply not getting what we want. But the truth is it's really hard sometimes for us to be objective about what a need is and what a want is as well. Sometimes it's very hard. You ever look at somebody else and it's so clear, isn't it? Ben, you don't need another one wheel. You just don't. Like the one you got is good, it works, you don't need another one. But Ben's sitting there going, well, hang on, I can't, no, I don't know, I think this one's got a chip in the corner and look, no, this... Sometimes it's really, really hard to discern for yourself what a real need and a want is, isn't it? Objectively looking at other people, we kind of feel like we can work it out really well for others, but it's a, a, a bit, more, bit more shady when it comes to us. But God has an answer to that too. In Psalm 37 verse 4, here's what, the, what David, King David wrote. He said, Take delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Let me tell you what that actually means. The, the Hebrew word, I think it's anorg, I think is the word for delight. Take delight in God. And what it means is literally this. It means be pliable, be soft, be pliable, be soft and delicate. So what he's saying is, if you are pliable, soft and delicate in the hands of God, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now what does he mean by desires of your heart? Well, what he means is this. The emphasis on this, this, this passage is not on the desire of your heart. In other words, who wants a brand new BMW in this room? My wife's hand went up. She'd love a Beamer. She was talking about a Beamer, right? You'd love a brand new BMW. Well, the emphasis is not because you desire a BMW, God will give you a BMW. I'm not saying he won't. I'm just saying the emphasis is not on whatever desire you have. What that passage is actually saying is this. To delight yourself in God means to remain soft and pliable in the very hands of God. Remember that passage, he is the potter where the clay? It's that same imagery of being the clay. And what it's saying is this. If you delight yourself in God, if you stay soft and pliable in the hands of God, the actual desires you have, God will give them to you. So by sitting close to God and getting to know God, God begins to shape and mould you as a person. So that the desires that you had before that maybe were more self-centred and more all about you or about prestige or image or reputation or whatever, if you sit close with God and do life with God, he says, I'll get into your heart and just like a piece of clay, he says, I'll mould your heart and I'll change the actual desires themselves. So all of a sudden, now you have the desires that God wants you to have. And when you pray for those, guess what? God comes through and gives them to you because they were his desires in the first place. It's the changing of the desire, not the free-for-all, everything I want. God, you promised. I mean, you said, Lord, if I delight in you, you'll give me anything. No, no. He said, if you delight and remain pliable in my hands and humble before me, I'm going to shape your very heart and I'm going to place in you the very desires that I want you to have. And then when you chase after those desires and bring them to me, of course I'm going to meet them because I put those desires in your heart in the first place. But of course, one final thought about that, you've got to be the kind of person that's prepared to be humble and pliable in the hands of God. And that comes back to us in our relationship with him. So number one, know the difference between a need and a want. Number two, understand what enough looks like. Understand what enough looks like. I wonder if you've ever thought about what enough looks like in your world. You ever heard people say, I don't have enough money? All of us have had this internal dialogue, don't we? There's that voice in the back of the head that says to us all of a sudden, oh, you, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough money. Now, I wonder what would happen if we stopped and internally turned around to that same voice and said, can you tell me what enough actually is? I think most people would go, uh, uh, well, here's a thought. If you don't know what enough is, how do you know you don't have it? If you actually don't know what enough is, how do you know you don't already have enough? So you've got to know what enough is. You've got to look at your world, look at your life, and set some parameters and, and, and get a, a bit of a, an understanding of what does enough actually look like in my world. Because you may surprise yourself and realise, I actually already have enough. Here I was thinking, I don't know, what's enough, what's enough money? Simple one. Well, if you don't have a budget, you probably won't know. Finance 101 here. Get a budget going. How much do you need? How much money do you need to pay your bills and to feed your family and have your house and put your fuel and do everything you've got to do? And then on top of that, of course, you want to have a holiday and have some savings. Like, what does enough look like? How many, how, if you don't know what enough looks like, you could end up being one of these hamsters on a treadmill doing four and five jobs, working every day, every night, constantly going, well, I have to take that because we need the money. Oh, we need the money. Well, how do you know you don't already have enough? 
See, most people don't know what enough looks like. How many is enough pair of shoes, ladies? I know I'm treading on sacred cows here, and I'm probably getting outside of the, the anointing of God, and I'm fearing for my life as I say this. How many pairs of shoes? Is, I'll, I'll give you a revelation. You know you can only ever put one pair on at a time. Men, how many power tools do you need? How many power tools are enough? Ben, how many fishing rods are enough? No, actually, that's a bad example. I agree with you. You never have enough fishing rods. But in other areas of life, how do you know what enough is if you've never thought about enough? I, I, I went to, remember when the floods hit? I went through my, my cupboards the first day when the floods hit and nobody had stuff. I went through my cupboards and literally I loaded bags and bags of clothes, right? I mean, I, 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 I was so moved upon with compassion for these people that I gave them my West Tigers football jerseys. Nobody gets a West Tigers footy jersey out of me without God. I'll tell you that now. So it must have been God. I loaded stuff up and took stuff. But you know what I was amazed at? As I'm going down there unloading these big bags out of the car, I remember thinking, when the heck am I going to wear these? How did I end up with so much clothes? How did I end up with 13 jumpers and 26 T-shirts? And How did I end up with that? Well, the answer was very simple. I just never knew what enough looked like. Because I never thought about, well, what's actually enough? So every time I go to a shop, oh, I've got to have that one. Oh, yeah, I'll get one of those. Yeah, I'll get another two. I already had enough. And then my enough became way too much. But guess what? I was like that guy that had, Jesus talked about, a guy that built his barns and had all this excess stuff, you know, put all this stuff in the barns, and then he had too much. So what did he do? Well, he went and built bigger barns just to keep it all for himself. And Jesus says, why'd you do that? One day you're going to die and someone else is going to get it all. You had enough for yourself in the first barn. Why didn't you give it away? Bless people, help people. You had enough. You had enough. But most of us don't actually know what enough looks like. So how do you know if you're going to hit that magical target of enough if you actually don't know what enough is? Socrates said this once. He said, he who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would like to have. If you're not content with what you have, you won't be contented with what you would like to have. Moving on, number one, know the difference between a need and a want. Number two, understand what enough looks like. Number three, commit to a life of gratitude. Commit to a life of gratitude. There are two constant yet conflicting realities that you live with and I live with every second of every day, and it's this. There are things I have and there are things I don't. Simple as that. It's not complicated. It's not hard. I didn't go to university to get a degree in that one. I just know for a fact there's some things I have and there are some things that I don't have. But no matter how much I have, there's always going to be something I don't have. But no matter how little I actually have, there's always something I do have. There's always something I do have. There's always something that I can find a little bit of gratitude for in my life if, if, if I'm prepared to go looking for it. Gratitude is about putting your focus back on what you do have. Putting your focus on where you are. And not allowing it to drift off into all the other things in life. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 19, Paul writes this. He says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in how many circumstances? He says, Give thanks have gratitude in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Now, by the way, what he's not saying, what he's not saying is the circumstance itself is always the will of God. He's not saying that. You might be sitting there going, well, how do you give thanks when, 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 when this, you, you, you're struggling with cancer diagnosis? How do you give thanks when you've just lost your house and everything in a flood? How do you give thanks? He's not saying the circumstance itself is what you're giving thanks for. What he's saying is it doesn't matter what's going on in your world, give thanks. That's the will of God. The will of God is to be a person of gratitude. The will of God is to always be a person that's thankful to... Because what, again, whatever you don't have, there's something you do. The will of God is that we be grateful people and that we be positive people and that we be thankful people for that which we do have. It's the will of God that we always give thanks. That's what he's saying. Not so much the circumstance, but it's the will of God to always give thanks. My nanny used to say to me this. She used to always say, don't get your knickers in a twist. Anyone ever? Hear? My nan. When I was a kid. And that was, that was basically my nan's way of going, it's not as bad as you think it is. Okay? You, you'll get through this. There's something good. There's something positive to look at. Don't get your knickers in a twist. And I think that's what, if I went back to the Greek, that's probably what that means. In all circumstances, don't get your knickers in a twist, people. Okay, 
Remember when Jesus was staring at a crowd of 5,000 people? Everyone remember the story? He fed these, these he had 5,000 people plus women and children, probably a crowd of 10,000. Right? It's in John chapter 6, I think. And, and, and he's got 10,000 people there, and, and he's going, How are we going to feed these people? And, so, and this guy comes up, one disciple says, We can't do it, it's impossible. Another one comes up and gives him five loaves of bread and two bits of fish. <laughs> Seriously. If I was Jesus, I'd be looking at five loaves, two fish, then looking at 10,000 people going, Is this a G up? Like, what's going on? Come on. Are you guys that dumb? Seriously, look, what are we going to do? We're going to crumb it and walk it. What are we going to do here? But it's interesting what Jesus does. He says he takes that. I'm sure he looked up and went, what I have here is not enough. But the first thing he does is what? It says he gives thanks. He gave thanks. He didn't pray over it to multiply it like I was going to do with the salad at the end. Tim's going to do it. He's got more faith than me. Pray over the salad at the end of the service. It wasn't that. He didn't do that. It says that he took that. He looked at the crowd, realized this ain't enough, gave thanks. And one, what happens when you start living a life of gratitude, you start to notice that, well, maybe what you've got is more than what you think you've got. Maybe what you've got is enough. Maybe it's just the fact that you're looking at everything else and not looking at what you've got. And gratitude brings our focus back in to what we've got. And when Jesus gave thanks, all of a sudden, that which was not enough, it suddenly became enough. And so we want to be people that live with an attitude of gratitude. And gratitude turns that which looks like it's not enough into something abundantly more than you ever expected. So giving thanks shifts my focus from what I don't have to what I do. Moving on, number one, know the difference between a need and a want. Number two, understand what enough looks like. Three, commit to a life of gratitude. Number four, and this is another simple one, develop the daily discipline of prayer. Develop the daily discipline of prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing, not just in our communication to God, but it, God has made a commitment to bring stuff into our world as well. In Philippians chapter 4, back in verse 6 and 7, here's what Paul says to the Philippians. He says, don't be anxious about anything. That sounds like a state of discontentment to me. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, there's that gratitude again. He says, present your request to God. That's our part. In everything we're going through, all situations, let's take the time to present our request to God. Let's, let, let's get before God and go, okay, God, here's the deal. Here's what's happening. Here's what's going on in my world. I'm anxious. I'm discontented. Here's, here's the reason why. Here's what's happening. And then in verse 7, he says, and here's what I'll do. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. You're not thinking yourself into this state. God is saying, this is not something you're mentally going to just, just chant mantras over until you've transitize yourself into a state of calmness. He says, no, no, this is something I'm going to do. It goes way beyond human understanding, way beyond your ability to comprehend. I'm going to bypass your brain and I'm going to place peace in your heart. He says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding, it's going to guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. That sounds like a soul at rest to me. Sounds like a soul at rest to me. So commit to a daily life of prayer. Make the discipline of prayer a part of your world. And the last one, we've got know the difference between a need and a want. Number two, understand what enough looks like. Number three, commit to a life of gratitude. Number four, develop the daily discipline of prayer. And finally, number five, run with an eye on heaven. Run with an eye on heaven, people. This world is imperfect. But there's a world that is perfect that we're not going to get to see till we depart this imperfect world. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, the writer speaking about Jesus himself said this. He says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily ensnares. All the stuff that slows us down from running the way God wants us to. He said, just, hey, just get it out of your life. It's not helping you. Some stuff's just slowing you down. And it's not all sin, by the way. He says there's sin and there's also things that just entangle you. You know they're just slowing you down. You know they're just stopping you becoming all that you're meant to be and doing all you're meant to do. He says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. This is your life. He's speaking about your life. The race marked out for you, it's your life. And yours is different to yours, different to yours, but you have a race marked out for you that you need to run. He says, run it. And then in verse 2, he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, now he's talking about Jesus, because Jesus had a joy set before him, it enabled him to endure the cross not get taken down by the shame, and right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. What's he saying? He's saying this. He's saying that, you know, when Jesus was about to face that, he had one eye on heaven. He knew what was coming, but he had an eye on the day that he'd be seated again in heaven with his Father. And because he had an eye on that and he knew it was on the other side, he said, I can do this. I'll deal with this, and I'll make it through. Because you know what? 
there will be absolute, total freedom, joy and contentment on the other side of this. And he kept an eye on heaven. And we need to do the same thing. We need to realize that we are aliens and strangers. I hate saying that. It sounds kind of weird. But the truth is, if you have a Christian worldview and you believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and you believe in, in, in life after this and heaven and eternity with him and you believe in all that stuff, then this part of your existence is the most smallest part of it. Because eternity is a long time. I'm 50 years of age and I feel like, geez, where's that gone? Mate, it's not even a drop in the bucket when I think about what's going to happen on the other side when I shed this beautifully sculpted tent I live in. Hey? Right? You've got to be confident. Don't put all your eggs in the earthly basket. There's so much more waiting up ahead. Part of our discontent is the fact that we know deep down we were made for a totally different environment than this one. We were made for more. We were made for heaven. We were made to be in the presence of God 24-7, looking upon him. No more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. That's the world we were originally created for. And that's what our hearts and our spirits cry out for, is to be there again. So live your life with one eye on heaven as well. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16, we'll finish with this. It says, all these people, speaking about these great heroes of the faith, the writer of Hebrews goes on, he lists all these great people, men and women, that, that were amazingly committed to God and did great things. He says, all these people were still living in faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they'd left, then they would have had opportunity to return and go back. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he's prepared a city for them. And there's a city prepared for us beyond this world. We started this journey of talking about discontentment with a simple phrase that the difference between a contented life and a discontented life is about 90 degrees. If you want to stand here and just look at everything the world has to offer your whole life and keep your focus here and catch up and keep up with the Joneses and go for it, you can do that if you want. But you're going to find so much fodder for discontentment, it's not funny. But if we can learn to lift our eyes a little bit, get them focused on God, realise what we do have, who we do have, and the opportunities that are there for us in this life and the reality of the fact that one day we're going to slip through this one and we're going to be with Jesus for eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for your word. Father, thank you for the great examples that we have of men and women uh, in that space. And Lord, thank you for Paul. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that Paul wrote those words that in all things I've learnt the secret to contentment. God, I'm so grateful that we can find a, a level of contentment in this life, that, Lord, we can be contented with what we have, primarily because we have you and we know that you're with us, God. So, Lord, I just pray as we get up and we leave this place today, Father, don't let us just move on to the next thing and next week we come back and there's another topic. Another God, I, I pray that we would wrestle with the seeds that you've planted. I pray we would listen to the Holy Spirit inside of us. I pray we would think about our life because, God, it's not what we know, it's what we do that makes a difference in our world. So, Father, bless uh, everybody here today. God, I just pray over the food. I pray you bless that food to our bodies, bless our time together this afternoon. And, Lord, as we finish up at the end of the day and we leave here, God, would you give each of us in this room, each of us that know Jesus, give us the opportunity to share the goodness of God with somebody, God, somebody out there right now that doesn't understand that God loves them, that he's for them, that he died for them, and that he has a plan and a purpose for their life that is way better than anything they could possibly come up with. We commit these things to your hands in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Amen.